Um, hi, Tamar, can you hear us? Hi. Hi. Very glad you joined because we were just coming up with a contingency plan. So <laughs> this is much preferred to actually have you online. Uh, thank you, everybody in the room, for your patience. Um, thank you for joining us today for this important event, The Never Ending War fact finding on the humanitarian crisis in Florida Karabakh Arkansas. My name is Jess Peek, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Office of Human Rights and the Director of the International Comparative Law Program here at UCLA in Boston. This event is co-sponsored by the Promise Institute for Human Rights, the University Network for Human Rights, the Promise Armenia Institute, the International Comparative Law Program, the Armenia Law Students Association, the Armenia Students Association, and the Journal of International Law and Foreign Affairs. This event calls attention to the ongoing human rights and humanitarian crises in Nagorno-Karabakh, Pakistan, and Armenia, following the second Nagorno-Karabakh war between Armenia and Azerbaijan in the fall of 2020. As you may have seen in the news, this situation has escalated dramatically over the past couple of weeks. In late September, the Azerbaijani military launched an offensive against Nagorno-Karabakh, forcing them to agree to a ceasefire and the dismantling and disarmament of their forces. Since then, Armenia and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees have reported that more than 100,000 refugees have fled over the border from the Nagorno-Karabakh into Armenia to escape ethnic cleansing. For context, there is about 120, or there was about 120,000 people in the Nagorno-Karabakh prior to this event. The new self-proclaimed leaders in the Nagorno-Karabakh have said that the region will cease to exist and will be reintegrated into Azerbaijan, with all state institutions being dissolved from January 1st. These actions likely constitute the war crime of deportation or forcible displacement of the population, and may meet the requirements to be considered a genocide. We won't be analyzing those factors in this event today, but I encourage you to join us for another event on this topic next Monday, October 10th, where we will be discussing the ongoing situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, and the duty to prevent and to punish genocide under international law. Returning to our event today, the presentations and discussion will focus on the preliminary findings of the fact-finding trip to the region prior to the very recent exploration, conducted by four Promise Institute students this past summer with the University Network for Human Rights, which is a cross-campus research and advocacy institution facilitating human rights work across the globe. This fact-finding mission by our students was the final of multiple fact-finding trips, two in Nagorno-Karabakh and four in Armenia, between March of 2022 and July of 2023, conducted by partners at, Hale, at Harvard Law School, uh, Advocates for Human Rights, Wesleyan University, Oxford University, and Yale's Lowenstein Project, in order to investigate and document atrocities being perpetrated against ethnic Armenians. Thus far, the investigation has resulted in a briefing paper with recommendations to Azerbaijan, Armenia, the international community, and the private sector for ending the crisis, an op-ed in Newsweek, and a letter to the UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, analyzing the risk factors present, warning us of an ethnic cleansing and the risk of genocide that is now under control. A full report and analysis of the situation will be launched by the University Network later this year, for the purposes of facilitating interventions to end the crisis and efforts around accountability. First, we're going to hear from Tamar Karakian, who is the, the director of the University Network for Human Rights. Then we're going to hear from four Promise Institute Uni University Network fellows who traveled to the region this summer. We have um, Misha Guggenheim Hall on my far right, next to Kat Washington, Luis Martinez, and Emily Wilder. They are going to share about the on-the-ground work that they did this summer and the rights violations that they witnessed and documented, as well as some of their personal reflections on this work. So now I'm going to turn things over to Tamar to give us a little bit more background on both the situation and the university network. Tamar, over to you. Thank you, Professor Peek. Um, how is the volume? Are you all hearing me okay? Always have to double check here. I'm going to turn you up. Just <laughs> okay. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, let me start off by saying that it's 
wonderful, uh, despite our chances to be reunited with our uh, March uh, student fact-finding team. It's great to see you, uh, Misha, Kat, um, Luis, and, and Emily. Uh, and also uh, great that you have all four continued to, to work on this project since the fact-finding uh, trip in July. Uh, the situation clearly needed as many hands um, on the on the ground and as many as many eyes on on what was going on as possible and and you were among the last uh, international team uh, working on fact finding before before things took a turn for for the worst case scenario that we all witnessed last week uh, and are still witnessing. Uh, let me introduce myself again briefly, just for the context of everybody who, who who's watching. I'm I'm Tamar Haidikian. I am director of programs at the University Network for Human Rights. I'm also senior clinical supervisor. So it's more in the latter capacity uh, as a supervisor of this last, of one of the last fact-finding uh, trips to Armenia uh, and, and the region near Nagorno-Karabakh that I'll be sp speaking uh, with you with you all. Um, and then hopefully you'll hear more from the students uh, and their experience uh, in fact-finding something that was developing and unfolding in, in real time. Uh, so the University Network for Human Rights began fact-finding in Armenia and even in, in Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh uh, while it was still accessible, barely, but still somewhat accessible uh, to, to foreigners uh, in March 2022, so last year. And that was before the um, in, infamous September 2022 attacks on sovereign Armenian territory. It was before the blockade uh, that began in December of 2022 uh, began, that lasted for 10 long months. Um, it was before the first major disruptions in, uh, or it was actually simultaneously with when the first um, major disruptions in, in energy supply through the gas pipeline through Shushi uh, commenced. We were there when that, when that started. Um, and we had, that was the first trip uh, we, that was with uh, a group of students from from Wesleyan and Yale, and we've been back three times since. And the description for this panel uh, and uh, in the presentation that you gave, Professor Peak says that that the, that this group of students was uh, that that these four Promise Institute fellows were on the last fact finding trip. And that was the intention, uh, in fact, that that would be the last fact-finding trip. And in fact, the very first fact-finding trip was supposed to be the only fact-finding trip. But over these, and, and the first report that we were supposed to release was supposed to have been released two, two years ago. Um, but the situation continued to get worse and worse. And every time, it's, it's, it's almost like when, when, I think students will understand this very well, and so will academics, when you, when you press save on a document and you, and you write final right next to the, the name of the file, and then you have this one really is the final one, and then definite final, uh, that's almost what it felt like uh, and what it still feels like in, in working on, on the fact finding and on the publication of the findings of everything that we do in, in Armenia and, and Nagorno-Karabakh, because this wasn't, in fact, um, the final fact-finding trip. We now have another field researcher on the ground um, documenting um, this latest, the, the latest uh, episodes of the final chapter of the ethnic cleansing that we've all been warning against, warning about. Um, and there will probably be more, um, but that's uh, that's kind of the the situation that 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 we're that we're in, and uh, the role of the university network is consistent with what our mission and our stated purpose is, which is to facilitate a supervised interdisciplinary engagement uh, at the undergraduate and graduate levels in the practice of human rights, and it's kind of under that. Um, within that 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 framework and that role that we have that this uh, group of promise fellows was able to 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 accompany us uh in that fourth uh, fact finding trip to to armenia uh we partner with advocacy organizations and particularly with community based organizations and in this in this in the case of the armenia project in in documentation uh in documentation and uh, coordinating advocacy but particularly in in documenting firsthand uh, from victims and from witnesses of a range of different types of abuses, uh, starting 
from the 2020 war, uh, immediately in the aftermath of the 2020 war, and all of the subsequent chapters uh, leading up to, to today. Um, I think I'd like to give a bit more context. I think I'll just summarize for everyone what, what is it that what is it that happened um, in a few concrete bullet points. Uh, there was the 2020 war and all the terror and intimidation during and since the 2020 war. Uh, what we've documented across these four fact-finding missions are the brutal killings of civilians, including particularly concerning of the elderly and disabled, arbitrary detention and torture of prisoners of war, destruction of cultural heritage, uh, forced displacement well before uh, this last wave, and direct attacks on, on civilian populations, all against the backdrop of, of hate speech uh, and, and racial discrimination. After that was the 10th month siege of Nagorno-Karabakh um, that began with an in inc incremental increase in the, in the degree of, of, clo of closure of the Lachin corridor uh, up to the point where even humanitarian aid wasn't entering leading to statements that that in and, in and of itself um, constituted genocide until finally there was the, the 24 hour offensive, the blitz of the entire region of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, let's not forget that that was preceded by what many in the international community applauded as a partial lifting of the blockade, the first convoy of humanitarian aid, um, a, a forced deal uh, with uh, Azerbaijan to allow entry through uh, a back road, through the Agdam road, uh, Akna road, into um, into Nagorno-Karabakh, which many on the ground and us as well were warning was not uh, was was not a positive development and made, created even more vulnerability for the already vulnerable communities uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, within a day, I think the the following day, two days later, the the blitz of um, Nagorno-Karabakh began. In 24 hours, it was over. Um, it began with all of the residential communities on the outside of, of the area being pushed out uh, quickly. We still are don't have all of the facts about who was unaccounted for and what took place in the communities that were that were pushed out uh, from the border areas of Nagorno-Karabakh to escape as quickly as possible. Uh, and it is important to remember the sequence of events. Uh, the Azerbaijanis, Azerbaijani forces forced the Nagorno-Karabakh to at that point accept the terms of surrender, which included, um, in not so many words at the time, but uh, about a week later, the dissolution of the de facto, the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. Uh, this was, these were terms of surrender at gunpoint, uh, not an agreement between equal parties. Uh, the armed forces surrounded the population at that time and effectively that the population of Nagorno-Karabakh was faced, was threatened with uh, either mass forced assimilation or slaughter. And after several days of terror or panic, because again, remember the, the corridor out to, uh, to, not, to, to Armenia was still closed after surrender and only opened on September 24th when en masse, um, everyone who could fled as quickly as possible. Um, and that is the end of the story. Um, ethnic cleansing has reached completion. Um, a lot of us saw this coming and Armenian organizations saw it coming and the students who are sitting in front of you saw it coming. Um, and unfortunately, none of that was enough. And the, the ethnic cleansing project of the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh has reached completion. Sorry to... And on that note, um, I think my 15 minutes are up. Yes, um, yes. I wanted to show you proof that we, we, we have seen it coming. In September of 2022, that was uh, over a year ago, the University Network released its first statement um, in response to the attacks on sovereign Armenian territory. We warned, I wonder if I can see that closely, that... Um, that we called for the urgent protection of vulnerable population in Armenia Nagorno-Karabakh. We warned that the main risks areas were extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detention and torture, and ethnic cleansing. That was over a year ago. 
Um, around that same time, Genocide Watch issued a genocide warning. Um, and then more recently, uh, Luis Moreno Campo called out the international community and called uh, what was happening in Armenia in against Nagorno-Karabakh a genocide, genocide by starvation. Uh, around then, uh, this was uh, again in September, uh, University Network published a preliminary report, prelim preliminary findings based on much of what uh, the Promise Fellows, do, Fellows also found on the ground called the tip of the iceberg, understanding the blockade of the Lachin Corridor as part of a wider genocidal campaign against ethnic Armenians. And then, um, sorry, there's a second slide with, yes. Uh, yes, around that time, we also presented a submission to the United Nations uh, Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide because the risks of ethnic cleansing and possible genocide became much too clear. The Lemkin Institute published a report uh, around pretty much, I think, the same day, completely independently, uh, analyzing the risk factors and coming to very similar conclusions. And, and you know, finally, on September 19th, uh, to 19th, 20th, 21st, 22nd, around those three, four days, some last minute, this is our last opportunity kind of alerts came out that um, ethnic cleansing was underway. So essentially we went over the past three years from saying that there are warning signs to ringing the alarm bells, to saying that ethnic cleansing is imminent, even going getting to the point of saying it is happening now, but it can still be stopped. And to to where we are now, where is where 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 are we now? Well, it, it happened. Um, so I think it's a very unique experience, especially from a, the the perspective of a student who who's also learning how to fact find and learning about a very complicated and and, and not well known situation. Uh, to be essentially sitting and, and engaged in a moment where there's an opportunity to prevent the worst from, from taking place, an opportunity to, to hold people accountable for prevention, to hold states and international actors accountable to prevent atrocities. And then now, days later, being on the other side of that um, and how that changes the, the advocacy perspective, how that changes the priorities, um, what how you have to then immediately switch gears and start thinking about the narrative and justice and you know what possible solutions are maybe trying to see is there still hope do we have to change the strategy now so there's a lot of a lot of questions and also probably a lot of emotions um and a lot of confusion and a lot of learning happening and i think i will i'll stop there and let the students and rather than speak on what on behalf of the students let let them speak speak for themselves of what this entire experience has been like from from being on the ground to to watching uh what's happening now thank you, Scott, thank you. for that really important background and context uh, i wanted to let our audience know that there will hopefully be opportunity to ask questions after the presentation so please keep that in mind uh, i'm now going to turn it over to uh, emily wilder who is one of the fellows who traveled to the region this Oh, thank you, Tamara, and a helpful thorough background on the project of UNHR. As Tamara described, um, this has been a several years long project. It took on many iterations before we as UCLA students got involved this past summer. Um, and up until, up until and through this point, it continues to change because of the circumstances and violations and violence on the ground continuing to escalate and mutate. Um, what we would like to do in this uh, portion of the presentation is uh, share of our experience as UCLA students um, getting involved starting in May of 2023 and going on that fact-finding report, fact-finding uh, trip in July, this past July. Uh, share both about the content of what we found in our independent research and in our research on the ground and share info about our personal insights and perspectives, why we were compelled to join this work in the first place. Um, the lessons we learned about ethical investigations and interviewing practices, uh, the most po poignant moments of our trip, and why we think this kind of human rights work is so important. Um, so we'll we'll each begin our own uh, part by 
describing a little bit about um, our individual abuse subject areas. Before and following the July fact-finding trip, we were each assigned or took on one or two of six um, violations under international law to gain a little more expertise in and fill out the report on and do fact-checking on. Um, these include extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detention, torture, enforced disappearances, destruction of cultural heritage, hate speech, and, and I think forced, forced displacement, I'm not sure about that one. Um, and those were helpful analytical categories under international law to describe and kind of um, analyze the uh, what UNHR was witnessing and documenting on the ground. Um, so I will begin with extrajudicial killings, which are illegal killings of people outside of any legal framework. In a nutshell, what we found regarding extrajudicial killings is that from the beginning of the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war uh, through today, Azerbaijani uh, military forces extrajudicially killed Armenian civilians and Armenian soldiers in Nagorno-Karabakh um, in numbers that are difficult to definitively quantify, but that certainly top 150. Civilians were killed when they, when Azerbaijani forces invaded their towns and villages and uh, executed them in their homes or dragged them from their homes and killed them outside. Uh, some civil civilians were killed by Azerbaijan's illegal use of munitions on residential areas. Many, as Tamar described, of these civilians were elderly and or disabled and therefore un unable or unwilling to flee before Azerbaij Azerbaijani forces overtook their villages. Um, and their soldiers who were disarmed or uh, wounded or surrendered or otherwise no longer involved in combat and therefore protected from killing under international law were also summarily executed. And we also found that many of the most egregious and brutal cases of extrajudicial killing for both civilians and soldiers were filmed and posted online by Azerbaijani soldiers who were involved in the killings and circulated in, in, in a celebratory fashion, further terrorizing the family members of the victims and surviving Armenians in general. This Our research on this subject but consisted primarily of compiling secondary source documentation of, uh, of each of these cases over the last two years, there's been many publications about extrajudicial killings from organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, as well as local Armenian um, advocacy organizations like the Center for Truth and Justice. We compiled those and analyzed trends among them. And we were also able to conduct a limited number of face-to-face -face interviews with families of victims of extrajudicial killings. And uh, one of those is the interview that I would like to highlight. Um, this was an interview with um, the sister of a man who was beheaded on video in one of the most widely circulated videos of extrajudicial killings. She now lives um, in a village outside of Yerevan. We, uh, this was the last uh, interview that we conducted during our trip in July. <clears throat> and uh, this video is so but it went so viral that we were pretty familiar with the content and circumstances of the step already. But hearing from it, hearing about it from her, from his sister, from she described herself as his caretaker. They were they were each other's only surviving sibling. Um, she lived with him in Nagorno Karabakh before she was displaced. Uh, that was absolutely the most poignant moment of the of the trip for me. She described their childhood together. She described how she was made a refugee multiple times in her life because of anti-Armenian ethnic hatred. Um, she talked about their beautiful home in the karabakh and the one that she was forced to flee because of the war. And she talked about the day that she had to leave and her brother refused to leave. So he wanted to stay in his home. And um, a few days later, he was killed. She described how she felt um, alone in the world and totally abandoned by the world. She looked it up and said, you know, you watch this video and it's hard for you, but can you imagine what it's like for me to see it um, or to hear of it? And at one point she looked at me and Luis who were taking notes um, of, the, of the conversation and she said, why, why are you writing this down? 
she has essentially lost any faith in anything happening to help her or to help her brother. Um, and she, yeah, she she had lost faith in in this mattering, and at that point, she really didn't care that he wanted to share her story. Um, and that was deeply, deeply humbling for me. Uh, both it, it was you know an exercise in listening to the most traumatic experience of somebody's life with empathy and humanity, and also being sort of called out and and wanting to do something to, and wanting to help her, wanting to tell her we could help her, but not being able to make promises we couldn't keep, and. So I'm, I have a background in journalism. That's part of why I came to this work in the first place. And I'm really deeply familiar with this notion of um, of wanting to your stories or, and the voices you elevate to have huge structural impact and change everything. Um, but you can't promise that. You can't even bank on it or expect it. Um, what you must, what you must be fully appreciate is the impact, the small impact, but a huge impact that really matters of making somebody feel seen and heard on individual interpersonal level. With that, I'm gonna pop it to please. Can you all hear me well? It's really difficult to talk about things like torture and extrajudicial killings because these are terms that belie entire realities and sets of traumas and nightmares inflicted on masses of people, but uh, we're going to try to share some of the voices and perspectives that um, you know bring the weight of these atrocities to life, uh, indicating further like the need for dignity and warranting these people the seriousness and respect that they were denied. So, uh, my two report sections were torture and arbitrary detention, and I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to give a really brief overview of this section before sharing some of the perspectives that and some of the main insights that I drew from my time on this trip and working with you all and with community partners on the ground, which I believe represented a cornerstone of our time in Armenia to actually work alongside people who were not just people who were subjected to rights abuses, but people who were actually working there, you know, for decades now to combat uh, what is what is undeniably a historical set of rights abuses against people for who they are. This this was something really impactful for us, and we made sure to align all of our work with uh, the the needs and the values of the insights of community advocates and organizations on the ground. But uh, one of the most impactful insights from my work on the torture section was thinking about motive and thinking about the systematic nature and what all these different sets of circumstances across victims of torture revealed to us about how Azerbaijani military forces executed these attacks against ethnic Armenians. One notable insight is that Tamar, Tamar developed this, this, this framing and then shared it with us and then we applied it to our work. But when Azerbaijani military forces capture ethnic Armenians, you know, during the war and then in, in the aftermath of the war, and then continue executing these systematic rights violations against them, they take them through various phases of detention, you know, from a police holding site to an NSS KGB prison chamber to, it, it, it moves in phases and almost so methodically so that you can trace them and generalize from that a pattern of, of extended rights abuses. And, you know, you ask, why are they doing this? And why are they subjecting them to torture in these specific ways and over time? And while that is, what, that is gruesome and absolutely horrific content, I think it shows that despite our, our our trying to frame this, like or trying to put this into some sort of formulaic representation like that, what we could never really put our hands, what put our fingers on was why they're doing this in the first place and why wh where this comes from besides uh, a cesspool of hatred. And I, I'm not sure there's a much more nuanced or complex answer. You know, you can point to you can point to complex historical roots and sociopolitical roots and geopolitical tensions and all these mass social variables that are fueling the present crisis. But I'm not sure you can you can so rationally characterize and describe the source of hatred that drove that drove military forces to one of these rights violations against ethnic Armenians. So that was something that um, it, it was absolutely horrifying. And then in the arbitrary detention section. We also observed that there were wartime detentions and then there were post ceasefire detentions in and surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh. And 
something really difficult is that when there is a geopolitical conflict that concerns boundaries and borderlines, that's often that's often ripe as a pretext for Azerbaijani military forces crossing an invisible line of demarcation and then entrapping ethnic Armenian soldiers, civilians, and other victims of rights violations, and then subjecting them after arbitrary attention to all the other rights violations that we're hearing from all of us today. So those are some of the main insights from my work on those two sections of the report, but I wanted to share two main insights with you all, general insights. And the the first one is, you know, when when I came back from the trip, people would ask me, you know, how was it? You know, what what did you see? What did you discern? What did you feel? And I think something that I've found myself coming to say, no matter who I'm speaking to in the aftermath of the trip, is that uh, there is such a stark contrast between the beauty we saw, the hope, the smiles, the amount of life in Yerevan, the the this like maximal this maximal take on life and on the human condition and on beauty and hope and then and, and then the, the the way that when victims would share their stories with us, they besides besides the interview we had, I think that was the one experience where I felt like the interview really didn't feel like there was hope, but everyone else they they shared with us or at least conveyed to us emotionally this deep sense of persisting the perseverance doesn't do it justice. It's it's really just the, the most profound form of human hope. So that really impacted me because ultimately they are sharing with you, as Emily said, the most traumatic and horrific things they've been subjected to in their whole lives. And to share that with you uh, with a view to finding justice in the future and moving forward and believing in the persistence of, of Armenia, its people and their human dignity against all odds. That is something that really, really impacted me. Um, to lose hope, the, the reason why I want to do human rights work in the first place or any of this legal advocacy across these issue areas is that um, I come from a community of immigrants who who lost their homes and, you know, they're about to lose their new home because of a bunch of different variables. But when when someone has lost home and, you know, or they've been denied the most essential part of their identity, being recognized as the sister, as the main family to, to the person who loves most in the world, her brother, that is that is something that you know to find hope despite that is is truly remarkable and i wanted to share with you all that when i think of Yerevan and i think of armenia i think of life and i think of beauty and i'm not armenian but i i wanted to share it with you all that i no matter where else i visited no matter any other place i've ever seen or traveled to i i haven't been left with with that impression of armenia so with that impression of a place besides an armenia um, and the other, the last thing that I want to share with you all is Emily alluded to this and, and she spoke about this in her own capacity, but it's really difficult to justify work where sometimes you feel like there's, there's going to be a little, you know, concretized outcome, like there's going to be a little change making after whatever you're doing and there are potential risks and especially security risks that you're exposing victims to and communities you're working alongside to, but, um, I think there is significant justice in listening to someone and in being there with them and and in according them the way that they've been denied. I think that that is that is something that I felt, if anything, was the most significant thing we did on this trip, just to sit with people, especially in border villages like Kodnitsov near Nagorno-Karabakh, and to listen to them. And on one hand, you can problematize this because we're elevating expectations that might be shattered, and that is, that is something truly precarious, and we really want to avoid doing that. But on the other hand, we also just want to make them know that we are there to listen to them. That is the main purpose of our being there. And we and what, when I think of this report, I think it's its main its main uh, its main mode of of normative or change making otherwise is is to foreground the voices of these people who might have never been interviewed in the first place and whose stories might have been left to oblivion. So I think ultimately that is something that is something that that I I I, I think it's the most venerable part of rights advocacy to listen to someone and to to truly be there with them. Hi everyone, my name is Kyle Washington and I was another student that traveled to Armenia this summer. My main areas on the report were enforced disappearances and forced displacement. And we, we did have some interviews relating to both of these topics. We had the opportunity to sit down with a survivor of the Pulsicon massacre. 
And as you know, Louise and Emily have both touched on, um, there's a there's a systematic process when these soldiers were taken. And they're essentially when they're when they're gone, you cannot point at the time for where they might be or what they're enduring. It's only when they come back, if if they come back, that we're able to look at this. There are also some interviews in terms of enforced disappearances that previous groups of students have conducted. And through those interviews and their testimonies, it's it's very clear that there's one group of prisoners born at the time that were that the world could have known that they were there. Azerbaijan said, we have these men in custody. But then there were prisoners that they didn't admit to having in custody. And these men, some of them, were held long after the war ended on paper. Some of them never came back. Um, it, it was the man we spoke to. He knew that other people from his group had also been taken. Not all of them came back. And just for sake of time, I'm going to keep those explanations a little brief because we do elaborate on this a lot more in the formal report. Um, in terms of forced displacement, I don't think anything compares to what we've seen in the past two weeks with 100,000 ethnic Armenians being displaced from their homes. But even before this, during the war, after the war, people were either intimidated into leaving their homes, violence was used to try and scare people or physically move them, for context for anyone who may be le less familiar with the conflict, the war ended in 2020. There were shellings of Armenian cities in 2022. And we've seen how this culminated over the past two weeks, but it's it's been an ongoing issue. And yeah, like we kind of said, I'm not sure how we can resolve it at this time. But there's one somewhat happier story I want to tell is we spoke to families in a village called Kordinzor, which is very close to the border. And we did hear stories about the loss of economic um, resources and how that can decimate a village. If your animals cross over land that used to be yours and no longer is, and the other country won't give it back, you've just lost a substantial amount of income. And it's incredibly sad to see the village kind of at what we can imagine the shell of what it might have been beforehand. But kind of like Louise said, there's there's all there was a lot of beauty in our trip. Um, does does anyone show of hands not know what Bardavar is? There's no way all of you guys know this. Come on. <laughs> okay, okay, that's fair. Um, we didn't either, so. <laughs> For context, it's a holiday where you get to throw water on strangers. And this includes all the Americans visiting your village. <laughs> and so before we had the chance to sit down and talk with this family about everything they've suffered and lost and what little hope they have for the future, a family we were speaking to saw us get water thrown on us by the local teenagers outside and said, come back inside. I've got buckets and water. You guys can go get them. So there is a video somewhere on our phones of me running outside in business casual with a bucket of water after these Armenian teenagers who would not come close enough to the door for me to get them easily. I had to run. <laughs> There's also a video of one of them coming inside this woman's house and dumping a bucket of water over my head. <laughs> and I, I'd rather share that moment in detail with you guys versus sitting down with these, like hearing these horrible things people have experienced, just to have you appreciate the beauty of the country and the people and what we can hope will remain, but also what is being lost and what's at risk of being lost. Because when I think of what's happened in Artsakh and Nagorno-Karabakh this week, I think of this family from the village because that village has, um, they're, they're so close to the border. The border that was previously um, 
you know, a landfill with up to our unions, but yeah. And I know we talked briefly about kind of managing your expectations when you're talking with victims, but for any other students who are hoping to kind of go into this field of human rights or any, any type of work where you might be in a situation like this, I think it's also really important to manage your expectations with yourself because none of us were, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I don't think we were surprised when this happened two weeks ago. And it's devastating. Even, even just looking on a personal level, knowing that we as students did everything we could. People like Tamar did everything they could. The Armenians who have been screaming about this for years did everything they could. And this wasn't enough. And so I guess that is a more depressing note to end on. <laughs> but it's it's kind of learning how to use that as motivation. Just because this chapter has ended the way it did doesn't mean that the work's going to stop. Kind of like Tamar mentioned earlier, um, you move into a different framework. We focus more on how we can get justice for what has occurred and is still occurring as people are forced to leave their homeland. And so it's devastating and it's hard to manage the expectation that everything you do still might not be enough to stop this. But being able to internalize that is your reason to keep doing this work and finding new ways forward even when people want you to think there are not. Thank you. Uh, my name is Misha. I uh, my the sections I primarily worked on were the destruction of cultural heritage and uh, racial discrimination. But I think the best way to really understand how these specific categories of rights violations fit into this broader picture is understanding where they got us today and where we're at today. So I'm I think the best way to really discuss this is to understand how our work relates to these more recent violations, these more recent events um, that we may have been foreseeing, but couldn't engage with at the time of our mission. And I think something really important to, to understand here and a point that a lot of um, that previous speakers mentioned was the, was the central challenge of what we're doing of on the ground fact finding on the ground practical human rights work especially when there's a legal background to it is that you're confronted with the fact that law that international law often imposes these taxonomies on human experiences that such that transcend this categorization that transcend these rigid typologies of law but you're you're forced to work within these paradigms nonetheless. And I think one that one of these typologies that's been mentioned a lot in recent weeks has been ethnic cleansing, which despite escaping an authoritative legal definition, it's not an actual legal term, has a lot of significance, especially from a rhetorical standpoint. Whatever definitions have been put out there, most of them uh, regarding ethnic cleansing focus around policy towards the ethnic homogenization of a specific geographic region. And this number that we talked about uh, before that the previous speakers have mentioned, 100,000 really encapsulates this. A 120,000 population estimate is often attributed to Nagor This is an This is an old number. We're not 100% sure of its accuracy, but it's helpful to use for news purposes. However, after what we've witnessed in the last few days, we have a more complete picture. 100,000 just over have fled to Armenia. This morning, a preliminary report came out from the UN mission that just arrived in Artsakh yesterday, Nagorno-Karabakh yesterday. This mission, one of, the mo one of the most striking conclusions in this mission's report was that there remains anywhere between 50 to 1,000 ethnic Armenians in nagorno karabakh This 120,000 figure was, was an overestimation, but I think more strikingly that this 100,000 figure represents almost the totality of the ethnic Armenian population that once inhabited 
the lands of Nagorno-Karabakh that are indigenous to these lands. And when when we're looking when we're looking at this in context of our work, we have to we have to understand that after so much loss, where does our work fit into this? Where does it matter? How do we not slip into the hopelessness that our that men that is gripped many of the witnesses that we discuss? And I think the I think the best way to understand this is by understanding what was lost. That these people didn't just lose homes, didn't just lose physical material belongings, they lost the sense of identity, a sense of belonging, a, sta a sense of statehood, this cardinal interest of statehood that Hannah Arendt described very famously as the right to have rights, the right to rights. That's what these people have lost. As displaced people in Armenia, many of them homeless, they have lost the right to be taken seriously. They have lost the right to dignity. And that's really what our, what our findings, what our report, what our work is trying to give back to these people, a sense of dignity, a sense of their identity hasn't been entirely erased and cast into the, into the tech, into textbooks, into history, that, that there is some hope for justice, right? And for many of you who have seen recent uh, reporting recent narratives on um, current events in Nagorno-Karabakh, you'll see that the dominant narrative from Azerbaijani politicians, from government officials, is that Armenians left this area voluntarily, that this was an exodus on the victim's terms, essentially. And from a practical, possibly legal standpoint, I think that's where our findings best fit in to the current picture of establishing that that's not the case. In order to understand what's known, at least in the context of the crime of deportation, what's known as a coercive environment that prompted a specific displacement, I think our findings are, and the findings of our community partners that were mentioned are key to understanding the coercive environment that forced these dis this, this displacement. Armenians didn't just pick up everything they, every, everything they own and leave suddenly for no reason. They picked it up because they understand this context. They understand the brand of rights violations that their compatriots have been subjected to for decades. And they knew that this would be what befalls them if they remain. I think our report is very hard. Um, it's, it's very hard to justify this type of work to victims who feel like the international community has failed them persistently. But we we through these types of findings, through these contributions towards the, the march towards justice, I think we as on the ground students who have participated in practical human rights work, I think this is where we can, we can fit in, in showing people that they do have advocates out there, that they have not totally lost every, everything, that they still have support, and most importantly, that they still have hope. Thank you, um, Louise, Kat, and Misha, for sharing so powerfully, candidly, and openly about your experience of doing this work. It's very clear that you approached this work with care, thoughtfulness, deep respect, and appreciation for the beauty of the community. And this has very clearly been a very profound experience for all of you. And you will all be better advocates and lawyers because of what you've experienced during this fact kind of mission. The work that you've done and will continue to do is important. And I really, really appreciate and thank you for talking about the challenges and the difficulties you faced, but also the beauty that you found and how you can continue to motivate yourself in doing this work. As we've heard, there have been and continue to be a huge swath of rights violations being committed against ethnic Armenians in and outside Nagorno-Karabakh. And despite what Kat mentioned about the Armenian community continuing to raise the alarm, the international community has not done enough. It has not acted to stop the ethnic cleansing in Nagorno-Karabakh. As Misha mentioned, the UN just sent a mission to the region yesterday, but it's it's too late. That was something that needed to happen weeks or months or even years ago. And very unfortunately, we're no longer talking about prevention. Um, instead, the conversation is turning to prosecution for the crimes that are occurring in the region. So we have a few minutes remaining, and so I'd like to open it up to those in the room to ask questions of the students and to Mark. I 
I also see that we have some questions online. Uh, it's a little bit difficult for me to see those, but I will. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Lots of comments about sound. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, Joshua, let's start with you, please. I'll, I'll repeat or oh, paraphrase your question. Thank you, Joshua. I'm just going to summarize for our virtual audience. Um, you had two questions. The first about methodology. Uh, what did the students do to verify and authenticate the stories that they heard from uh, victim and witnesses? And then secondly, a more technical question, which was how much did the fact-finding team have in mind the different components of international crimes and how they might need to find information that supports those various components. Um, I'm not sure if he wants to take those questions. Misha, maybe you first. I was thinking potentially the second question, but I could I could start off with that. So we can go possibly more technical to more methodology. In the technical sense, of course, we are, um, for better or for worse, confined to existing legal frameworks in terms of seeking concrete accountability measures. And I think the elements of certain, of both international crimes and the contours of certain rights, the substance of certain rights, certainly inform the that's about gathering information. One of the, one of the I guess, archetypes of archetypal crimes in question here that fits quite well into that is the uh, both the war crime and crime against humanity, of course, full displacement or deportation, um, which requires um, some more technical support in the sense of the forcibility of displacement and also the actual geographic location of displacement. Uh, in the latter sense, whenever we would interview a witness uh, with that would potentially have information in this regard, we pay particular attention to have them map out the exact course of their displacement. So we understand from whence they were displaced because most of these people did not have a really clear path to displacement. It wasn't that they were displaced from their village and were displaced immediately to our media. It was a multifaceted, uh, something that was referenced before multiple times over the coming refugees. So that was something that was very important to our, um, our methodology when approaching victims of forceful displacement to map out a clear path of being potentially displaced during the first, during the second Nagorno Karabakh war, the, the 2020 war, to a village within Nagorno Karabakh, a city within Nagorno Karabakh, 
and then being subsequently displaced by future military action, potentially to Armenia or elsewhere in the Guantanamo. Regarding the forcible nature of displacements, we also took special care to understand the reasons why people left. And I think this is where the rigid taxonomies can often meld with this more humanistic lens of really understanding the reasoning that went behind such a crushing decision for, for a lot of these people that goes behind the decision to suddenly uproot everything in their lives and run, essentially, um, the humanistic lens that can be taken to analyze something like that, some real deeply personal story, can also be key to establishing how a specific displacement was forcible, how there was, to use the kind of the legal terminology, no genuine choice on the part of the victims um, besides anything. And I think it's really important to emphasize, I guess, in a for for those, I guess, with who've not spent excessive time looking at the definition of the crime against humanity or force of displacement, that it doesn't, it's not only through physical force that an individual can be displaced in an illegal manner but also through psychological coercion, through fear, through pressure. And that's what the population of nagorno karabakh experienced during the 2020 war and continues to experience now with this more en masse deportation. Thank you, Misha. And would you maybe... I can speak a little bit more to the methodology around authentication. Um, there are a number of ongoing ways that this is happening. Um, but the one that I will speak to is that uh, for each case, for each story, um, for each number, uh, we're triangulating a number of different data points. These include reports from officials within Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, on the ground Armenian civil society organizations that are doing firsthand reporting and documentation, our own interviewing with uh, victims or families of victims, as well as using things like open source um, digital evidence to help uh, verify, you know, a place or a time that something uh, took place because we're dealing with so much digital evidence because so many of these crimes were filmed and posted. Um, and that that kind of open source investigation that what we call OSINT, um, we're doing under uh, the advisement of uh, Professor Pete. Uh, but if anyone wants to add to that. Yeah, I'll just say super quickly, I think um, uh, Emily alluded to the presence of digital evidence in these videos, particularly Telegram videos. I think that's something that we use to often to corroborate and victims themselves during their interviews would open up their phones, show them to us and say, this is this happening to, you know, my colleague, my fellow soldier. And I mean, it, it wasn't. And Tamara would work assiduously throughout the trip also to, to just engage in her own verification methods. I would see her working on this nonstop just to make sure everything was in line. But I think exactly as I was said, triangulating between media, also local media, that was particularly important. And uh, like the interview Emily alluded to, a lot of the interviews we spoke with, they were not necessarily, you know, unknown, you know, the cases like these were things that were known. And then, you know, community members referred us to other people within communities across communities. So, you know, I was I was a little bit, as Tamara might remember, the first day we got there, I was a little bit confused as to how we were going to go from place to place and how we were going <laughs> to determine who we'd speak to next. But um, she told me, oh, no, this is literally by referral. Community members are pointing us in different directions. And with across these varieties of sources and with these communities and across spaces, it is it is very much just a triangulation-oriented process. So it's interesting to see how we got from interview to interview to Okay, unfortunately, we are already over time, and I want to be respectful of people who have class next and then class that needs to come into this room. Um, so thank you so much, Anne, Luis, Kat, Misha, and Tamar, both for engaging in this truly vital work, and also for sharing your experiences with us today. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we're going to have another event. It's actually on Tuesday next week, not Monday. So it's Tuesday, October the 10th at 7 p.m., and we'll be discussing atrocities, genocide, and the duty to prevent and punish under international law, the situation of Nagorno-Karabakh Artsakh. You can find more information about that on the Promise Institute website and social media. And we really, really encourage you to sign up for that event. And we're going to have five speakers, five very excellent experts in these issues discussing um, the legal framework and, and what can be done in this situation. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I believe that lunch is outside. Apologies that that was delivered late, but please do pick something up as you leave. 
And thank you so much for joining us here today.